The X-Wing is one of a select few Star Wars designs that originated directly from the pen of George Lucas. This fighter, originally referred to as the Dart, was sketched by George Lucas himself on a sheet of notebook paper, and the design was then visualized in three dimensions by artist Colin Cantwell, who worked closely with Lucas to develop prototype versions of most of the ships in the original film. True to form with George Lucas's interest in racing culture, Colin Cantwell built the main fuselage of the X-Wing around the body of a dragster from a 1 16th scale Ravel model kit, forever cementing the X-Wing's iconic elongated nose. This fully detailed and articulated model would be used to attract prospective studios to fund the film, but ultimately the design would be further developed by Joe Johnston before the final version appeared on screen, and thus the Colin Cantwell X-Wing model, having served its original purpose, would be relegated to collecting dust on a forgotten ship shelf somewhere. That is, for a little while. I've been very closely studying the background ships that appear in fleet shots in The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, and it's been really exciting to rediscover all these cool ships that Star Wars kind of forgot. And while studying the rebel fleet that shows up at the Battle of Endor, I noticed this. It's a very wide, very spindly looking ship, and I actually puzzled over this thing for months. It obviously had an enormous wingspan, but there just weren't enough clues from this very limited angle. But then it struck me. It kind of looked like an X-Wing, just a bit more spindly than we're used to. What looks like an X-Wing, but has more slender proportions? The Colin Cantwell model. To confirm my suspicions, I loaded up all my reference material into photogrammetry software to produce a rough, and I mean very rough, 3D model, but it was enough to get a decent angle match on the frame from the film. And sure enough, it was a pretty compelling match, especially considering that slender details like the tips of the blasters are probably missing due to slightly soft focus and that loss of detail that you typically get with vintage blue screen compositing. So if I'm right, that actually means we have a legitimate X-Wing variant in the original trilogy. Granted, it's only one shot, but I do believe it's there and it opens up a ton of interesting storytelling possibilities. You know me, I just couldn't help myself and I just had to write a backstory for this ship. So here goes. By the final year of the Clone Wars, both the Z-95 and the ARC-170 Starfighter had entered frontline combat with dramatic results. These robust fighters, designed by hand by the Incom Corporation and mass-produced in sub-pro factories, easily outmatched the comparatively flimsy and underpowered droid fighters of the Separatist Navy. Consequently, fighter battles were quickly becoming a one-sided affair in favor of the Republic. Looking to turn the tide back to their favor, the Separatist Council sought Valahari Shipworks a company friendly to the Separatist cause and with a strong reputation for high-performance experimental fighters. With an exorbitant commissioning fee secured, the masterminds at Valahari Shipworks quickly set to work designing what they would eventually call the RF-1 Dart. The Dart was an ambitious design that promised to improve virtually every facet of existing Incom fighters, but after several unexpected delays, the prototype was barely flightworthy by the end of the war. Shortly after the war, newly declared Imperial Force forces occupied Valahari. Despite a fierce battle and an attempt by the Valahari to destroy their own prototype hangars, Imperial forces discovered the Dart in pristine condition. Understanding immediately that this prototype fighter was an attempt to emulate Incom design, Imperial engineers shipped the Dart to the Incom Special Development Complex, an isolated Skyhook facility in the Alten system. The Incom Corporation suddenly found itself under immense pressure. The Empire was not hesitant to openly discuss with Incom representatives that the mere existence of the Dart signaled that there were deficiencies in Incom fighters. The Incom Corporation needed to achieve nothing less than perfection with their next generation fighter. Up to that point, Incom had been the obvious first choice for the Empire. Even a manufacturing powerhouse like Kuat, which had earned a strong reputation producing interceptors for the Republic, was largely winding down its fighter production to focus more heavily on the development of new capital ships. And although Sinar fleet systems had obtained the right to many of Kuat's fighter patents, Sinar was primarily seen as a manufacturer of high-end transports and specialty craft. But if the Incom Corporation was even a mild problem for the Empire, Imperial technocrats would have no problem spontaneously terminating their ties with Incom in favor of another company. Naturally, the engineers at Incom set themselves immediately to reverse engineering the secrets of the RF-1 Dart. The very first thing they noticed was its striking S-foils. While the Dart clearly took inspiration from the radiators of the ARC-170, the Dart abandoned fixed wings entirely, giving it a remarkably stark and beautifully aggressive X-formation. Consequently, the Dart would quickly take on the nickname X-Wing. Incom Chief Executive Condor Vantis took personal interest in the craft, relocating from corporate headquarters so he could personally oversee 
see the reverse engineering process. Vantis was truly impressed with the Valahari adaptations on the traditional Incom approach, and he became obsessed with the idea of directly basing the next generation Incom fighter on the X-Wing prototype. But what was so impressive about this fighter? The X-Wing essentially doubled the base firepower of the ARC-170 by affixing four powerful laser cannons to four variable geometry X-formation radiator wings. The wing's surface area was significantly greater than the ARC-170 and allowed the fighter to shed a higher heat load during combat. Consequently, the X-Wing not only boasted improved engine performance, but could also achieve a far greater rate of fire. The X-Wing's elongated nose contained an advanced sensor suite, which allowed the X-Wing to acquire targets from well outside the engagement range of the ARC-170, giving it a devastating edge with its proton torpedoes. Altogether, the X-Wing was easily regarded as doubly superior to the ARC-170 and, shockingly, even more nimble than the Z-95. Everyone at Incom was relieved that the Separatists never managed to get this design to combat. Basically, no Republic fighter, Incom or otherwise, could have contended with it. However, the advantages of this fighter proved extremely difficult to realize in practical tests. According to the technical readouts, the X-Wing outperformed Incom fighters in basically every way, but in actual flight, its performance was only decent, roughly on par with the Z-95, but with a significantly higher burden of upkeep. So it soon became apparent why the Valahari had struggled so much to manufacture a production model of the Dart. It looked good in theory, but no living pilot could ever successfully harness its abilities into a true functional advantage. Essentially, an entire year of troubleshooting at Incom had evaporated. By this point, Incom was already falling behind the expectations of the looming empire. After Incom had thrown all of their talent at the now stagnant X-Wing development, other companies were apparently surpassing their prestige. Kuat, despite focusing almost exclusively on new Star Destroyers, had managed to produce a competent and fairly popular successor to the Nimbus Interceptor, and rumors suggested that Sayonar was already developing their own new radical design. Meanwhile, Incom had nothing. Imperial delegations routinely monitored the X-Wing development project, and it was soon clear to them that Incom was making no visible progress. Incom operations officer Ida Citrona fervently negotiated with the Empire for more time and leniency, but the Empire's message was clear. Incom was required to deliver a production-ready prototype by the time the next Imperial delegation arrived. Looking for solutions, Citrona and Executive Vantis poured over production logs from Valahari, looking for any clues as to how the original engineers might have intended to make the X-Wing work. All they could find was a brief note cryptically referencing a partnership with Soro Sub. After a full appropriation of schematic data tapes from Soros Sub, they discovered that Valahari and Soros Sub had been joint developing a pilot-to-machine mind bridge interface for controlling starships in precisely the same way that one might control a cybernetic appendage through mental impulse alone. It was thought that by removing the barriers of physical controls, it might be possible for an organic pilot to unlock the hidden potential of the X-Wing. But the mind bridge had a glaring flaw. It invariably destroyed the brain of anyone who tried to link with it. After dozens of test subjects had been reduced to vegetables, the Valahari scrapped the project, but Executive Vantis ordered a recreation of the device anyway. He was confident that his hand-selected engineers could succeed where Soros Sub and Valahari could not. He was wrong. In fact, reconstructing the interface turned out to be an enormously costly endeavor, which faced all the same problems. The deadline was rapidly approaching, and Executive Vantis had a useless prototype, a potentially lethal pilot interface, and nothing remotely resembling a production-ready starfighter. A morbid mood pervaded the special development facility. The engineers were losing hope. Operations Officer Citrona had apparently disappeared. The X-Wing project had nearly ruined Incom. No, it wouldn't end this way. Executive Vantis could not allow his life's work to fade into oblivion. Incom was the future. The X-Wing was the future. And at any cost, he would realize that future. Executive Vantis himself donned the pilot interface. Nobody before had ever truly survived the process, but unlike the unfortunate test subjects of the Valhari, Executive Vantis would be using the device by his own volition. He understood the price of failure, and he had the will to succeed. Upon activating the machine, Vantis found himself in indescribable anguish, but finally, through the force of sheer will, he succeeded. His mind had linked with the machine. And so the time had come for a true test flight to prove the capabilities of the X-Wing once and for all. Directly tapping into the X-Wing systems, Vantis effortlessly outperformed every single record that the Incom Corporation had ever set. The X-Wing was viable. 
But the mind bridge had consequences. Executive Vantis was irreversibly fused with the avionics of the X-Wing. His mind had essentially become indistinguishable from the programming of the flight computer. He would never again be the same person. But with this grim realization came an epiphany. The Incom engineers could now program a new computer, incorporating the raw flight data from Executive Vantis. Essentially, the conscious decisions that Vantis made while linked with the X-Wing could provide the necessary assistance for a pilot to unlock the X-Wing's potential. And with an onboard astromech droid to help the pilot multitask, the mind bridge wouldn't be necessary for the production X-Wing at all. Just then, Operations Officer Citrona burst into the facility with urgent news. The Empire was approaching the system. Although it seemed like Citrona had disappeared, she was in fact secretly gathering intelligence in the core worlds. According to her findings, the Empire had unilaterally rescinded its contract with Incom and awarded the development license to Sinar. And now Incom, along with all its staff, was seen as a threat. To avoid all this talent and their designs from falling into the wrong hands, the Empire would destroy any trace of the Incom Corporation. With only moments to evacuate, the engineering staff gathered every data tape they could find and rocketed away from the facility. They escaped not a moment too soon. The facility erupted into flames behind them, and the escapees found themselves pursued by the Empire's bizarre new fighters. Condor Vantis was still in the air for test flights, and with the last notions of his fleeting humanity, he wordlessly directed his X-Wing into the fray. He was impossibly outnumbered, but the X-Wing was a terrifying opponent for these Imperial pilots. No one knew who might win such a battle, but it was just enough to allow the Incom staff to escape. Condor Vantis and the X-Wing prototype would seemingly disappear altogether after that battle. Ida Citrona and the Incom engineering staff would themselves disappear from public life and resume Incom operations from a secret location in the Nada sector. Incom fired up production again, with its products manufactured in ghost factories outside the immediate reach of the Empire. After the company was partially re-established, the Incom engineers returned attention to the X-Wing project. They had lost the prototype, but using salvaged data and the test flight telemetry from Vantis, the production version of the X-Wing was born a ship that was more than a match for any Imperial fighter, largely thanks to its unrivaled flight computer programming, giving what would normally be a large and unwieldy fighter the ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with even interceptor-type ships. The X-Wing, with its tight handling and heavy firepower, perfectly rode the line between an interceptor and a torpedo bomber, and could excel at either role given the right pilot behind the controls. Ida Citrona, who was well-connected with subversive Imperial senators and officials, detected a keen black market demand for a robust and accessible combat starfighter to equip newly forming anti-Imperial groups who were short on professional training and manpower. Essentially, since every individual X-Wing flight computer was augmented with the mental impulses from Executive Vantis, even a pilot lacking professional training could take the X-Wing into combat effectively, making it a perfect fit for these groups who could now focus more directly on combat and less on rigorously training pilots. If Incom could supply X-Wing fighters to these groups, it would secure a long-term source of funding from organizations willing to spend whatever it took to secure a next-generation fighter to combat the Empire on equal terms. Incom would quietly designate this new fighter the T-65, which alongside the T-16 and the T-47 would inaccurately categorize the X-Wing as a sports airspeeder and not a combat starfighter. According to plan, this decision would ultimately allow Rebel cells to snatch up X-Wings without initially drawing too much attention from any Imperial authority who might be reading the receipts. By the time the Empire noticed what was happening, militia cells across the galaxy had been armed with state-of-the-art starfighters. So in a twist of fate, the X-Wing project originally commissioned by the Empire would become the Empire's worst nightmare. But it wasn't just these new X-Wings which were now causing havoc across the Empire. Stories arose sporadically of a lone X-form starfighter of an unusual design that would appear from the void, utterly destroy Imperial targets, and disappear as easily as it had appeared. Nobody recognized the exact make of this fighter, and the identity of the pilot was completely unknown. Soon rumors began to spread, and legends began to form about this mysterious vigilante. Some said that the Grey Escapist, which became the name of both the pilot and the fighter craft as far as anyone was concerned, was a bounty hunter using Imperial targets as a cheap means to sharpen 
and his skills. But as the escapist was never observed to land at any port, nor was seen to engage in any bounty hunting or mercenary work, the rumors gradually took on a more supernatural tone. Spacers began to say that the escapist was the vengeful spirit of a man who lost everything to the Empire and now roams from one end of the galaxy to the other, waging an endless war on the ones who stole his life from him. The Great Escapist would be little more than a legend until the Battle of Endor, where it would appear unbidden to fight alongside the Rebellion. The pilot would neither communicate with nor take orders from anyone, but would zip effortlessly across the engagement zone, shooting down a dizzying number of Imperial fighters. After the destruction of the second Death Star, the Escapist would disappear once more, perhaps never to be seen again. So that's how the X-Wing came to be, from Separatist Wonder Weapon to Imperial Pet Project to eventually the fighter that destroyed the Empire. At least, that's how I think it happened. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing my fan lore as much as I enjoyed writing it. This has been an enormous project that took over a year to assemble. And between writing, modeling, costume design, rendering, animation, music composition, this project involved a ton of different artists, all bringing their unique skills to make an amazing video. These projects are an enormous investment of manpower, and if you want to help support the channel and ensure that we can continue to produce content of this quality and of this scope, I encourage you to support me on Patreon, where you can join nearly 250 amazing people who keep this channel alive. If you would like to be a part of that, we would be forever thankful for your support. To the rest of you, I would like to thank you all so much for watching this video, and I'll see you next time.